from 1979 till 2018, began his encore career with the BJU Science Ambassador in August of 2018, along with his wife, Darlene. Couple things, um, at the end of the presentation, if we have more than what we have here right now, we will be exiting row by row, so just please be seated until uh, we exit you. Uh, also be advised of the exits, which are to the left and right in my rear, and also to the left of the uh, theater here. Please silence all cell phones. At this time, I wish that you would give a warm welcome to Dr. George Matsko and Darlene. There we go. There's something wrong. So glad to see you all today. And uh, how many of you have been to the ARC already? Okay, and how many are going in the future? Okay, that's everybody. So you got everybody going, that's great. You go to see that ark and you say, now I know how they got all those animals in the ark. Yeah. <laughs> it's really easy to see there. We, we really love it there. And we've really enjoyed our time here at the Creation Museum. My wife and I are from Greenville, South Carolina, where Bob Jones University is. And this is, we're, as was announced, this is our encore career. I like that. I couldn't find the word retirement in the Bible anywhere. And so encore seemed like a good thing. And so during school year, we travel around the churches and schools and put on presentations and talk about the Bible and science. And uh, we've really enjoyed it. And we've enjoyed our time here. Everybody's been so kind to us. Well, I know that sometimes people have to leave because there's a you know, a planetarium showing or something like that. So if that's your case and you're between uh, grades 7 through 12, we have some contact cards back there on the table. And if you could just fill one of those out for us and put it in the box, we'll enter you into the gift card drawing. I just want to make sure before we start it. Okay, let's go ahead and open in prayer. At Bob Jones University, we open every class in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can be here today. Thank you for the health and strength you've given to us. Lord, we pray you'll be with our country in the midst of this crisis, that you give wisdom to our leaders, and Lord, that people will turn toward God. Bless in this time we have together, and may you be glorified in it. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. Amen. So when we talk about uh, science in the Bible, I always like to talk about Christian pioneers of science. Uh, because a lot of times, young people don't know. They don't know that science wasn't started by atheists or agnostics. They, they, you know, they don't know that we have this rich scientific heritage. Uh, many of the men who started scientific disciplines were either Christians, or at least they had a high regard for the Bible and God's word, certainly creationists. And I wanted to tell you about Robert Boyle. Robert Boyle was born a 14th of 15 children to the richest man in Great Britain at the time. And his father sent him away to Switzerland to learn mathematics when he was 13 years old. And when he was there, there was a, like yesterday, there was this terrible thunderstorm, lightning storm, and he thought it was like the end of the world. And he got scared and he realized he was not ready to meet God. And so he got down on his knees by his bed and asked Jesus Christ to be his savior. And uh, his whole life, of course, changed. And he really dedicated his life to serving God. Even when he was a teenager, some of his friends, who were not as serious as he was, they said, wouldn't it be great, Robert, if we could just sort of sin all of our lives and then know at the end of our lives we'd have the, the time to repent and go to heaven. And Robert said, no, that'd be terrible. You'd miss out on all the blessings of being able to serve God in this life. And so he, he, even as a teenager, he was serious about serving God. As an adult, he started the, helped start the Royal Society. And many of the men in the Royal Society were, were men who believed that they were trying to understand how God put the world together. You notice that quote there, God would not have made the universe as it is unless he attended us to understand it. 
And so he believed in a God who did things in an orderly way. And because of that order, he believed there are laws that we could uncover uh, through science to understand how God made the world around us. Uh, he also, of course, was independently wealthy. He was able to um, get his whole, you know, buy a whole lab full of equipment and do his experiments. But with his extra money, he, he was interested in propagating the gospel all over the world. He, at his own expense, he had the Bible translated into other languages like Irish and Welsh and Indonesian languages. And he actually paid to, for copies of the scripture to be printed and sent to those places. He tried to get a copy of the Bible in the hands of everyone in Ireland because that's how passionate he was about getting the word of God in the people's hands. And when he, was, uh, when he died, finally, he left in his, uh, his uh, behest a, a uh, money to be used for lectureships to uh, defend the Christian faith against all opposing views. And uh, so he was an apologist as well. But his greatest apologetic was the fact that was his humble, sincere life of trust in the Lord all of his life. Now, Robert Boyle invented the manometer in 1661. It's just a J-shaped tube. It has mercury in it. And you can tell how much pressure is in the vessel by looking at the difference in the length of the mercury column. If you know the, how much gas was in there, the quantity of gas and the temperature, you can determine the pressure. And he used that manometer to formulate what we call Boyle's Law. Okay, the fact that the pressure of the gas is inversely related to its volume. So if I have a, a balloon here and I push on it, you can understand if I put pressure on it, it's going to get smaller, right? Okay, so we know that volume and pressure are inversely related to each other. There's his original data that he had to uh, describe that. Well, I can show you some air pressure uh, and... I can use my har bottle. Har bottle is just a, a bottle with a hole in the bottom and a balloon. This is one you can do at home. Just get a two liter bottle, put a hole in it and get a long balloon. I blow it up and it stays blown up. You ever seen the inside of a balloon before? <laughs> yeah, see, see the inside of a balloon, see, yep, like that. Now the people who sell these things, they tell you what you're supposed to do. You're is supposed to, to fill it with water and then you have a volunteer come up and look in it, and you go like this. Aren't you glad we didn't, you're not going to do that to you today? <laughs> it didn't seem very Christian to me to do that. By the way, this is my bride of 46 years. Wow. Thank you. And uh, she helps me out, keeps me on track, tells me when I mess up, and gives me whispers in my ear. Oh, okay. <laughs> so anyway, what keeps the balloon blown up in the in the bottle. Well, we have five miles of air pushing down on us. They're pull, pulling down by gravity, and so that air is pushing down, but it can only push down on the inside of the balloon. It can't push down on the outside of the balloon because the outside of the balloon is covered by glass. So we don't push on one side. That's what keeps it blowing up in the bottle. Okay. Why don't we feel all that air pressure on us? Well, because we have that same air pressure inside of us pushing out, so we don't notice the difference. Now, some of you kids, may you, when you go in the swimming pool, you dive to the bottom, you can feel all that extra pressure because there's a pressure difference. So we can only feel pressure differences. We can't feel the pressure because it's the same on both sides. And I can use that pressure to, to um, crush a can. Now, my wife thinks that Diet Dr. Pepper cherry cans crush the best, so that's the one. So that's... <laughs> That's her excuse for buying lots of Diet Dr. Pepper cherry cans for us to do. So put about a tablespoon of water into it. And then I'm going to, what I'm going to do is heat it up and fill, fill it with steam and then turn it over and put it into this pan of water and see if we can crush the can. It's ice water. Ice water. You want to make sure it's cold water. Oh, I have a graphic to go along with it. There we go. Now you'd think that the water would rush up into the can when it's evacuated. It's pushing all the air out, filled with steam. And when the, water, when the 
when the steam condenses, you would ex expect the water to rush in. It tries to, but it's just not fast enough. It can't get in fast enough, and the can will crush. Now, when I was teaching, I used to do it with those big five-gallon solvent cans, and it would take maybe a half hour. So I'd, I'd evacuate it, and I'd, I'd put a stopper in it. I'd put ice on top. And then while I was lecturing, it would suddenly go clang, and all the water would, all the ice would fly into the audience on top of the students. I really enjoyed that. <laughs> Shocking them like that. Okay, so we got steam coming out. Let's see if we can crush the can. Ooh. <laughs> see, that's really good. Yeah, this must be that diet Dr. Pepper Cherry that does it. Okay. Now we measure pressure using a barometer, mercury barometers. And the man who did this, who invented the barometer, his name was Torricelli. We still use part of his name as a unit of pressure. Instead of talking about millimeters of mercury, we talk about tors, okay? And so we use part of his name. Well, Torricelli, his first barometer was a water barometer. So he put a got a tube sealed in the end, filled it full of water, stood it upright, and was trying to measure the atmospheric pressure using water. Well, water is very light compared to mercury, and so he had to have a really long barometer. It had to be 35 feet long. Well, it stuck out of the top of his house, okay, and his neighbors could see it, and they thought he was involved in witchcraft, and they were getting ready to, to burn him at the stake. And uh, so he thought that was not a good idea. And so he, he figured out that if you use mercury, mercury is 13.6 times more dense than water. If he got a mercury bomber, he only had to have a short tube, and therefore his prying neighbors couldn't see what he was doing. And so a lot better than being burned at the stake, certainly. And you can see as the atmospheric pressure uh, strikes the um, Mercury, it pushes down the mercury, it pushes up in the evacuated tube. So the height of the mercury in the tube tells something about the pressure. I can uh, show you something about that pressure. This is a demonstration. I use my water demonstration, but it also works for this as well. You can do this at home, kids. Just get a mason jar and put some fly screen on there like that and fill it full of water. All the way up to the top and put a card on it, pull it out, and the water stays in there. These kids gonna help me here? You wanna... wanna come up and have a look? Oh. What'd you do? Tripped. <laughs> hey, come, come take a look at the water, see? Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. So it'd be interesting to see how big of holes you had to have in here before it would not stay in there. Now, what makes it stay in there? Well, some of it, some of it is cohesion, some of it's adhesion. Uh, surface tension, uh, but a lot of it's the air pressure, air pressure pushing it into the, into the jar. So I can get it out of there just by turning it sideways like this, and it comes right out. Aren't you glad he didn't do that over your head? Why don't you show them how you can do, <laughs> yes. they can do one at home, another one at home. Now we have eight grandchildren, and uh, if you're like me, you're always trying to find things to occupy them, right? And parents with little kids are trying to find something. This is perfect. You take, it's the same idea, but you just take a plastic bottle, <clears throat> not an inexpensive, cheap uh, water bottle because it's, it's too easy to squeeze it, and if you squeeze it, it'll come out, okay? So just get a bottle, take a piece of tooling, net, netting or tool, and rubber band it to the top. Now I'd recommend doing this outside or maybe in the bathtub, okay? <laughs> and you'll see why. Then you want to fill it all the way to the top, just like he did, just like Dr. Masco did on the other one. Fill it to the top. <clears throat> you can use a card if you want, or you can use your hand. And the trick is not to squeeze the bottle. Okay, and then you just slide it off your hand. <gasps> stop. <laughs> hey, it hurt you. Look at that. You said stop it, it stopped. That's pretty good. That's the nice thing about the plastic as opposed to the glass. Once you start pouring it out of the glass, it'll keep coming. You can't stop it. But here, as long as you stop squeezing, it will stop. Well, so stop squeezing. I know. Well, it's hard to hold this. <laughs> yeah, I'd then recommend you, a then strong you take, plastic. Then you take uh, yeah. toothpicks. You give them a whole box of toothpicks and let them and sit there and watch them float to the top. 
How many hours would you get out of that? There we go. So that's a wonderful demonstration of what you were talking about. I was talking about air pressure. Okay, very I good. I don't know how to turn it back over. Put your hand on it. There you go. You got it. Good job. We have a lot of fun. All right. Well, the aneroid barometer was invented in 1843. And really, it's just a metal box, evacuated metal box. And as the air pressure changes, it, it expands and contracts like this. And they hook it up to a mechanism with a pointer to be able to tell what the barometric pressure is. So I wanted to illustrate how it works using my pentapus. You know what a pentapus is, kids? You know what an octopus is? How many legs does an octopus have? Anybody know? Eight, there you go. So how many legs does a pentapus have? Five, there you go. Pentapus has five legs. There's my pentapus. It's got a little snorkeling mask on here. This pentapus actually obeys my wife a lot better than I do. Okay, Mr. Pentapus, let's see. Um, I think I want you to go down all the way to the bottom of the bottle. Get all five legs. There you go. See, he obeyed. Now I want him. He's a he. How do you know? Because he doesn't have a dress on. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> now I want you to go halfway to up, and then I want you to stop right there. Stop. Stop. Okay, now you can go to the top. Good. Okay, now let's see. Sometimes he'll even follow my, the lead of my finger. Okay, Kieran, would you like to come up and try it? Kale? See if it'll listen to him. Okay, say, say, Penipus, go down. Penipus, go down. You heard you. Good. <laughs> um, Penipus, go to the middle. Okay. There you go. Oh, he's too high. Go to the bottom. He was never good at math. That's the trouble. <laughs> he only has air for brains. And go to the top. Very good. Good. Thank you very much. Cool. You, you can just wait right here, and I'm going to have to show you something else. Okay, okay so how does that work? This is what we call a Cartesian diver. So like the, the aneroid barometer, I have a little, there's a little air bubble in here in the top of the pentapus. And I was using Pascal's principle. Pascal's principle is that when you add force to a incompressible fluid like water, uh, that that force is transmitted all the way through in all directions in the fluid. So it was transmitted to the little air bubble in his brains where his brains used to be. And so all I was doing is I was squeezing on him. See, I was squeezing on him, making him go up and down with my thumb, trying to let you see what I was doing. You can also make a remote controlled pentapus here. We want you just to squeeze on this. See if you can get him to go down. See if you can get it to go down by squeezing on it. Can you squeeze? There you go. There you go. And again, another toy <laughs> that the kids can enjoy playing with. I'll show you how to make one simply. Again, take Thank your you. bottle. Go back to your seat. Thank you. And get a ketchup packet. Now, all ketchup packets aren't created equal, so you have to take a, a bowl of water and see if it'll make sure it's going to float. Okay, I had some and it didn't work, and I said to my husband, I didn't know that I was supposed to test it ahead of time, okay? And I asked him, what's wrong? And he said, did you test to see if it would float? And I said, no. So, all of that, and then all you have to do, you could put a little smiley face on it and put him down in the water and fill it up. Not quite to the top. About, is that right? It doesn't, no, not, don't get too high. Yeah, Is that too that's high? fine. That's, that's fine. fine. Okay. Yep. Put the lid on this oh, one. He just sank. You didn't, you didn't test it. I did. I tested it at home. You drowned. You drowned the poor thing. Here, get another one. Let's test it. Okay, test it. It's floating. Okay. Okay. I did. <laughs> you know, they say that people remember science demonstrations that don't work a lot more than they do the ones that do. 
Okay, so we just did that so you'd remember the principle, I'm sure. <laughs> so then the kids can just sit outside all day long and squeeze it and have it go up and down and practice getting it to stop halfway. You can do this with a two liter bottle too, so that would even be better, right? It'd take yep. longer to go up and down. And so there you go. Okay. Well, I was talking about Pascal's principle. I wanted to introduce you to another Christian pioneer of science, and that is Pascal. Now, Pascal uh, only lived for 39 years, and he was in ill health the whole time. His sister, who wrote his biography, said there was never a day when he did not feel pain. So he had a very short and painful life. But at age 31, he had a conversion experience, and he became very serious about his faith in Christ. Uh, we, perhaps, you know, have you ever, ever heard of Pascal's Wager? Any of you ever heard of Pascal's Wager? Okay, some of you have. So that's the idea. Now, Pascal, his father was a mathematician, so he taught Pascal all of his, all of his uh, mathematics. And he was interested in probability and statistics, that type of thing. So he thought in terms of wagers. He was saying that if an agnostic uh, didn't believe in the Christian God, and if the Christian God did not exist, uh, he would have, of course, nothing to lose. And if the Christian God did exist, he had very, would, would, would lose eternally, okay, if he did not believe in the Christian God. So that's Pascal's wager. And... Here's something else he said. There's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person which cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by God, our creator, made known through his son, Christ Jesus. And if anybody knew about vacuums, it was Pascal. He knew all about vacuums. Pascal figured out why the barometer went up and down. He understood that it was this column of air going up into the sky. And so he had this great idea that he could tell how high mountains were, this is the mountain near his home, how high mountains were uh, based on the barometric pressure. So he actually concocted this experiment. He had two barometers and he left one down the valley and had somebody watch it. And then his brother-in-law, Pascal was too sick to do this himself, so his brother-in-law took the other barometer up to the mountain and measured the barometric pressure as he went up. And sure enough, what he found out is the barometric pressure is less at the top of the mountain because there's less air pushing down on it, okay? And so you can actually calculate the height of the mountain that way. Now, there are two gentlemen in United States history. Maybe you've heard of them. Anybody ever been to Mount Mitchell or Clingman's Dome in North Carolina? There's some here. Well, Clingman and Mitchell, they had this argument. Whose mountain's the highest? Now, we know today that Mount Mitchell is, is the highest east of the Mississippi. Uh, but the only way they had to measure it is by doing this same trick, to take barometers and go up and down the mountain. And you're hoping that the weather doesn't change while you do it. And so they, they were rushing up and down their mountains trying to figure out how high they were. And, and Mitchell slipped and uh, fell to his death. And he's uh, buried on top of Mount Mitchell today. And you can see his grave there. It says, in hope of the blessed resurrection. And uh, he was a man who knew God. And uh, so that's the way they measured mountains back there before we had GPS and all that kind of good stuff, okay? Surveying tools. Well, this, oh, I was gonna mention that Pascal also coined the name pressure. He's the one who came up with that word pressure for the weight of the wind. Now, sometimes people don't understand what pressure is. I have a demonstration to help you understand the difference between pressure and force, because I find a lot of people are confused about that. I bet that sounded good on TV. <laughs> Need to have a lot of hot air to be a teacher. Just hey. a little to be his assistant. We have a tube here. We're going to put a balloon on each end. And when we take the clips off, we need to have some hypotheses as to what is going to happen. That's the way you do science, right? You take a vote, right? Isn't that the way it works? So are they going to equal out? Is, one, is the pink one going to get as large as the blue one and the blue one as small as the pink one? Yeah. Or is the pink one going to get smaller and the blue one get bigger? Okay. Okay, let's vote. Okay, let's, number one choice is nothing's going to happen because that often happens with my demonstrations. How many think, how many think nothing's going to happen? Okay. 
Number two, how many think they're going to exchange volumes? That the blue, pink one's going to be as big as the blue one, and blue one's going to be as small as the pink one. How many think that? How many think they're going to equalize out, be the same size? Okay, you got, how many think the pink one's going to get smaller and the blue one's going to get larger? Anybody there? Nobody like that There's one? some people aren't thinking. Okay, how many don't think? <laughs> okay, here we go. You ready? I need a drum roll. Keep your eye on the pink balloon. Okay, so anybody vote for that option? No, so why were you wrong? That's the question. You're supposed to look at the formula. All right, see the formula? Okay, pressure is equal to force per unit area. Okay, so if the area is larger, the pressure is lower, right? So the bigger balloon had the lower pressure, okay? And the smaller balloon had the higher pressure. Let me describe it this way. Here's a push pin, okay? What's gonna happen when I push on the push pin? That's going to hurt my finger. It's going to hurt my thumb, right? So why doesn't it hurt my finger? Because this part has a larger area. So the larger the area, the smaller the pressure. The smaller the area, the higher the pressure, okay? Sometimes you've seen pictures, like out, out in the Midwest, they'll have these tornadoes, and, and uh, it'll pick up a piece of straw and put it right through a telephone pole because it has such a small cross-sectional area, okay? Well, we can demonstrate this another way. Are we going to have our volunteer come up here again? Yeah. Okay. Come on up, up the steps. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is to take this nail and slowly push it into the balloon and feel how much pressure there is. Let's put it up here where everybody can see it. Push slowly. Okay. Push, push, push. Okay. Did you feel that? Okay. Now... We're going to take another balloon and we're going to break it with 100, 100 nails. nails. Okay. Now you all know, right, that 100 nails, you're going to have 100 times the area of one nail. And so 100 nails, it should take 100 times more force to break a balloon with 100 nails than it does with one nail. So we'll put it here. And what I want you to do is to put your hands on either side like this and just slowly push down. Okay. You'll be able to see the nails coming up into the balloon down there. It's still not popping. You want to turn your hands around the other way? Like this. Put your thumb up here like that. I'll give you there more you leverage that way. Oops. Here we go. Here we go. Go ahead. All your might. Come on. Don't let that balloon beat you. You can do it. You can do it. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. You can do it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you got Thank it. you. Thank you very much. Hey. So 100 times the area, and you see this here, so we increase the area here. If force is one, area is one, that's one. If, if, if force is one and area is two, that's 0.5. If force is one and area is 100, that's 0 0.01. So we have decreasing pressure as increasing uh, area, okay? So if you understand the difference between force and pressure, you'll know a lot more than a lot of my college students did back when I was teaching at Bob Jones. So, I uh, hope you'll remember that. In 1856, Otto van Gurek uh, invented the Magdeburg hemispheres. By that time, they had figured out how to make vacuum pumps. So you got this big iron hemispheres, and he put them together with grease, and he pumped them out with the vacuum pump. And then at one point, he tied eight horses to them, four on each side. And he wanted to show how the, the atmospheric pressure was stronger uh, than eight horses. So that really amazed people in that day. Well, I couldn't get the horses through the stage entrance, so I'm gonna use these instead. So I have, what are, you, what are these things called? Suction. No, not that. <laughs> what is, yeah, some people call them suction cups, okay? So actually, there's no such thing as a suction cup because there's no such thing as suction. Okay, it's just more pressure or less pressure. I can push all the air out from in between them with the with the. Um, okay, and then we'll see if we can pull them apart. <laughs> it takes yeah. 200 pounds to 
of pressure or whatever. Is that like our marriages? No. Okay. <laughs> Neither one of us won. How about that? <laughs> okay, that's right. We both we both won. All right. So anyway, just flick the levers and they come right apart like that. Could, this is about 200 pounds. Yeah. Could you explain about the suction thing? Like I thought I sucked up through a straw. Now all you're doing is lowering the air pressure in your mouth, and then the atmosphere pushes it up the straw. That's a good demonstration you can do. You can get one, a straw that you can make real long and you can put it into a soda pop or something and climb upstairs, like in a stadium or something. And once you, you get to some point where it's too high for the atmospheric pressure to push it in, it's like that water barometer, okay? And so no matter how much you suck, you still can't get it up. So that, that's, that'd be a good demonstration if you have a stadium that you can use. Maybe you've seen these things, these like lily pads, you can put them on a, a bowl or something. But if you put it down like that, there's no air on the, between the um, lily pad and the table, so you can't, you can't pull it up, see? It's, it, you'd have to, you just pull it up like that. But if you pull this way, all the air pressure is pushing down on it like that. So you could really, you could put this on the top of your bowl. Instead of using all that saran wrap, you just keep using this. And you, you can carry the bowl around this way. Now, I haven't done it because I just don't have the faith. Although I should, right? Because look at that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can pull the table up. So Pascal died, as I said, young at 39. And his family published his scientific investigations. And one person who was very influenced by those was a man named Jacob Bernoulli. Jacob Bernoulli read Pascal's. And he came up with Bernoulli's principle. And the idea behind Bernoulli's principle is that here the, the fluid is, is moving slower because it's a bigger area. And so you have a higher pressure. And here as it goes through a narrow constriction, it's going faster. So you have a lower pressure. See, the pressure is different between those two. So the faster the fluid moves, the lower the pressure that you have. And this, the particular application of Bernoulli's principle is called the Venturi effect. I can demonstrate that using these ping pong balls and a hair dryer. So this is just a hair dryer without heat. And I'm gonna blow it over the top of the tube and I can, I, can allow the, I can lower the air pressure here at the top and the atmospheric pressure will push the ball up the tube and out and then you have to catch it. Okay. She's more athletic than I am, so I'm sure she can do it. All right, here we go. Here we go. Three for three. Good job. Well, we, we credit Bernoulli for discovering Bernoulli's principle, but really we should give some credit to the prairie dogs. Prairie dogs know how to do this too. I wonder who taught them. So prairie dogs, when they build their, their homes, they have a front door and a back door because they don't want to get trapped in there. And they always build the front door up high with a mound. So when the air from the plains goes over their burrow, you have, it goes faster over the mound. And so it acts like the Venturi effect and it actually air conditions their burrow. Okay, so they discovered air conditioning before we did. A lot of things that we've discovered in science are things that are already there in nature that God created. We're just copying uh, God's design, okay? Now, you've heard of Orville and Wilbur Wright, and they wanted to make a heavier than air flying machine. Now, Orville and Wilbur were, uh, it's hard to know what their religious beliefs were. They, they grew up in a conservative home where uh, their father was a pastor and they were very moral people. Uh, they didn't um, you know, break the Sabbath and they didn't drink or smoke or, or swear or anything like that. So people thought of them as upstanding Christian gentlemen, but they, uh, there's no evidence that they really ever trusted Jesus Christ as their savior. They never really went to church that much. Uh, but they had a high regard for the Bible and for God's created design. And so when they were trying to figure out what to do as far as flight was concerned, they spent a lot of time watching birds fly, particularly turkey vultures, and they noticed that the birds would bend their wings okay, to get lift. And so the way that works is the air goes up over the wing, 
And so you have low pressure on the top, high pressure underneath, and that's what keeps the, the bird in the air. And so when they made their uh, flying, air, 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 flying machine, they, they did it with curved wings. I'm going to show you a little clip of the first flight. Notice the curved wings. There's also a place where you'll see uh, some people pulling a weight. They're pulling a weight up to in a tower. They use that as a catapult to launch the, the plane to get some air going over its wings so it would fly. So watch. That would take a lot of nerve to be the first people <laughs> to go up in one of those. Of course, we don't see them land. I'm sure they must have, though. <laughs> yeah, they did land <laughs> successfully. Okay. Just think about how <clears throat> we can use science uh, to improve men's lives, you know, and how much, how much we've benefited by taking the bird's design and actually copying it and, and inventing the airplane. Okay, well, because uh, balls are around, the air around the ball will be low pressure and the air outside the ball will be high pressure. So I actually balance the ball in the airstream like this. Okay. Now what's going to happen when I put the tube over top of it? Will it send the ball down or will it go up? Up? Down? Okay, here, let's see. Okay. Nope, wrong one. Oh, <laughs> now you can actually get a balloon with a penny in it. It, gets you, it gives you some more control over it. So I can put it over my wife's head, make it look like she has a real good idea. <laughs> See, she has a real good idea there. I do have a good idea. I want to show you how, again, something you can do at home to illustrate Bernoulli's principle. This can has an indentation on the bottom, therefore. That's high pressure because the air is not moving. Okay. Okay. He's my science person. You can tell I'm not the science. I am the organizer of this team. Okay. Empty can in a mug. It's that simple. Here, let me try to catch it. The other person can hold that, and the goal is to have this fly like an airplane out of my cup into his cup. Now, he actually did it once the first time. I think, oh, I think this would one be more, a, one more time. This would be a one great time. youth activity, one more time. right? Do it. Do it. <laughs> Yay! Yay! Yeah, there we go. <laughs> now this one too. Did you put Oh that yeah, down? we didn't do you that. Have to vote. We always you like gotta to vote. Get a vote here. Okay, so now I have two balloons tied to a string here. I'm stuck here. Okay, let's just do it right there. Okay, now when I blow the air between the balloons, are they going to stay the same? Are they going to fly apart? Or are they going to come closer together? How many think they'll stay the same? How many think they'll fly apart? How many think they'll get closer together? OK, here we go. Let's see what happens. So they get closer together because it's a curved surface. 
you have moving air, and so the high pressure puts your rhythm together. So that's Bernoulli's principle as well. Are you ready to go up a notch? We'll go up a notch, get my leaf blower here, and see if we can balance some balls here. Now, if I'm careful, I can balance two balls, not just one. Let's watch. So Okay. And I have one really cool demonstration to do with this leaf blower at the end of the program. But I don't want to do it now because kids get really excited about it. And uh, <laughs> we'll do that. But you can see how it's important for us. Okay, Bernoulli's principle, how does it affect the, is it affected by the weather? How does it affect the weather? Well, think about hail, hailstones. Hailstones are round, right? And so the greater the updraft, the longer the hailstone can stay in the cloud and get bigger and bigger and bigger until it finally gets so big it falls down uh, to the ground. Or when we think about houses, they have kind of a curved surface on them and it's easy for wind to, to blow, if you're like a tornado or a hurricane or something, blow, blow the roof off. And so down in Florida, they, they bolt the roofs down to, to the foundation to keep them from blowing off. People want to know, can atmospheric pressure affect human health? Well, you, maybe you've had a sinus headache. You have, your sinuses are clogged and the pressure changes and that can produce pain. Or some people can feel when there's a low pressure system coming because the, the fluid in their joints changes viscosity and there's nerve endings in there. Uh, even our blood pressure. It makes sense that our blood pressure would change with the atmospheric pressure. So the higher the atmospheric pressure on the outside, the higher the blood pressure on the inside. And then people who are measuring their blood sugar, the viscosity of the blood changes with the air pressure. And so you can have some variableness in your blood sugar readings uh, because of air pressure. So there is an effect as well. Job 28 Verses 20 through 25, we see, For he looketh, talking about God, to the ends of the earth, and seeth unto the whole heaven to make weight for the winds. And so long before Bernoulli or Pascal or any of these people, uh, God in his word talked about the wind having weight, even before the word pressure was coined. And so this is an example of scientific foreknowledge. The fact that the Bible is not a science textbook, but the Bible, everything the Bible says is scientifically accurate. And sometimes the Bible tells us things uh, that science hasn't even figured out yet. This is one of those things. There are a number of these kinds of things that we see in the Bible where the Bible's ahead of the world, the ancient world, as far as scientific knowledge is concerned. Uh, for example, we call this scientific foreknowledge. The stars are too great in number to count. So God takes Abraham out and says, well, look at the stars, count the stars. And how many stars could Abraham see? God said there were as many as the sand of the seashore. But Abraham, he looks up, even with no light pollution, he said, well, you know, I can see maybe 3,000 stars. So that's nice, God, but 3,000. Well, but God, Abraham was a man of faith. He believed God when he said the stars were without number. How many stars are there? I used to tell people there are 100 billion stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way, and 100 billion galaxies. And I used to say that because it was easier to remember, okay? But actually, now the current number is 300 billion stars in our galaxy and 2 trillion galaxies we can see in the visible universe. And that doesn't count all the stars we can't see. So when God said the stars were without number before the invention of the telescope, uh, he wasn't kidding, okay? It really is without number. Or the fact that the universe is expanding from its original size. Now, there are a lot of verses about this, about God stretching forth the heavens. 
Uh, and really, it only was in the 20th century that we took the uh, Doppler shift and the radio velocities and so forth and figured out that all the galaxies are rushing away from us faster and faster and faster, something that the Bible knew that science did not know until fairly recently. Well, the fact that the Earth is suspended in space. This whole idea about the Earth being in a vacuum is something that people in the ancient world just could not accept. If you ask them, well, what, what's the Earth on? What's this, how's the Earth suspended? They would say, well, maybe it's on the back of a turtle. You'd, you'd say, well, what's the turtle standing on? They'd say, well, just a bigger turtle. And, you know, it's turtles all the way down, you know, that type of thing. Uh, and even to the end of the 19th century, uh, Michelson and Morley did their famous experiment trying to figure out the properties of what filled space. They called it the luminiferous ether. They felt that the, it could not be a vacuum. And there had to be actually some stuff in space. Uh, they didn't believe what God's word said, that God hung the earth upon nothing. And they spent their whole working lives trying to determine the properties of this luminiferous ether that didn't exist. Yes. Oh, you want me to do that? Okay, that's fine. We'll do that. She has one for me. So how does the Earth stay suspended in space? Well, it's through centripetal force. I'm going to put a cup here and of water. And then I'm going to... Now the string's going to supply the centripetal force for me. You've all been wet before, haven't you? Okay, well, that's good. Here we go. Let's see if we can keep it from... Okay. So the centripetal force from the strings. Did this in a nursing home once. And the nursing home was hot and humid and the cup sweated. The water was cold. We learned water. our lesson. Don't put cold water in the cup. And so the okay. cup went like right that, off. right over the head of some, <laughs> some dear man in a wheelchair. So, so anyway, you got to be careful with these things. All right. The life of the bless flesh is in the blood. Blood sustains life. So bloodletting was common in the ancient world, common even in our own country. George Washington, 1799, has a throat infection. And so they drained him of 40% of his blood, okay, about five pints. Okay? And we dispatched the father of our country because we didn't believe what the Bible said, that the life is in the blood. And we killed him. And uh, I don't know if he would have survived otherwise. Or this whole idea of entropy, the fact that the universe is, is running down. Okay? We see that in Hebrews chapter 1, that, that it's all waxing old as doth a garment. And this is something we didn't figure out until the 19th century. And I'm convinced that there are other things like that in the Bible uh, that are ahead of science, that we still haven't figured out in science. So when you get to, to something in the Bible, you don't understand it scientifically just give God the benefit of the doubt. Just say, he knows more than I do, okay? And uh, just realize that it may take a while for science to catch up to what the Bible says to be true. That's scientific foreknowledge. How do we know the Bible is the word of God? Well, we know because of the fact it was written over such a long period of time, 1,500 years, and uh, by all these different authors, and it all holds together. We know it because of fulfilled prophecy, but this is another way through scientific foreknowledge. It's so important to teach science from a Christian worldview, from one that honors the scripture and is true to what it teaches. And we try to do that at Bob Jones University. I taught there for 39 years down in Greenville, South Carolina, and we started every class with prayer, and we'd always do it from a biblical worldview. And our position on creation is the same as Answers in Genesis. Uh, we believe that Genesis is a factual narrative of historical events. We believe a recent date for the creation week, thousands, not millions. We believe the fall of man had profoundly negative consequences, including the introduction of death. We believe the flood described in Genesis 6 through 8 was a historic event, global in extent, catastrophic in effect. And we believe that God made humans in his image as rational creatures who are charged with investigating and maximizing the usefulness of God's creation. 
So sometimes I'll meet young people and they think the only way I can serve God is by being a pastor or a missionary or a Christian school teacher, that type of thing. But you see, science is one way we can fulfill the creation mandate. We can push nature toward a useful end and benefit mankind and thereby glorify God. Now, the Wright brothers were doing that. They're taking the design God had made and they invented the airplane and we benefited from it and God is glorified through that. So one of the great ways of serving God, fulfilling the creation mandate to subdue the earth, to fill the earth, is through science. I want to show you a three-minute video about the science programs at Bob Jones that I'm representing. The high quality of our programs demonstrate that our students graduate well prepared for careers in science and industry. Our students tell us that we're doing a pretty good job. Our graduates give us very positive feedback about how this is going. We have over 300 science, health, and engineering students enrolled each semester. And it's really neat to see the, uh, how they integrate one with another, really a sense of community here, um, especially in the science department. You can go in almost any room from when the building's open till they close late at night and there's always students that are working together, they're eating together, and it's really a strong sense of community that they have. Each of the faculty members is intentional about forming relationships with their students so that we can know them better and help them progress along. We care in the Division of Natural Science about critical thinking. The goal is to get you to think like a scientist or to think like an engineer, not just in a theoretical sense, but in a where the rubber meets the road sense. And we not only have students think, but they have to actually do stuff. And it's easy to make something work on paper. You can make anything work on paper, but actually getting it to work in the lab is another matter entirely. The students are really excited for the programs that we have here. A couple of the aspects focus on the personal relationships with other students as well as faculty. So the students, anytime they have a challenge, and they can come to the faculty, and the faculty really care for the students. I think most of the faculty are here primarily because they want to teach the next generation of Christian young people. Our faculty here hold to a recent six-day creation perspective. And we teach that not only in our Bible program at Bob Jones, but throughout the science curriculum as well. One of the goals that we have for our students is we want to be able to teach them to be able to think not only critically, but also to think biblically in terms of the way they analyze situations in the world. We have over 20 faculty who have terminal degrees or PhDs, and they've studied fields that are in different areas, specialized areas of health, engineering, and science and uh, they come to BGU with a passion to be able to teach the next generation and prepare them for uh, careers that God is calling them to. And we love relationship building with our students. Not only just represent um, themselves or Bob Jones University, but they end up representing the Lord Jesus Christ wherever they go. Preparing the next generation to know God, to love God, to serve God with their lives. That's really why we're here. We have faculty who are spiritual mentors like Vincenzo Antoniani from Naples, Italy. Wonderful story about how he came to know the Lord and now he answers Bible science questions for people in, in Italy, in Italian, and the Lord using him greatly. Or qualified professionals like Dr. Nick Gothard who uh, does laser research and uh, supported by the Navy. Uh, here are some of the programs we have in the Division of Natural Science. We have more information on the table back there if you'd like to get that. And are, we're known for our robotics program. We're involved with the autonomous vehicle competition each year uh, where they go through a series of courses and so forth with the autonomous vehicle. Often we come in top five, sometimes beating out big name schools with big budgets like Ohio State or, or Georgia Tech, that type of thing. We um, have a fish embryo lab and Serpentarium. It's one of the big boa constrictors we have there. Uh, we're trying to get, help get rid of those from the Everglades. And that's Dr. Chetta. He had an uh, emergency room practice. He had nine other doctors working for him. And he gave all that up in order to train our uh, health profession students. And uh, we have right below the level of the picture is a, a, a cadaver 
that we, we're one of the few undergraduate institutions that allows our pre-med majors and our nursing majors to work on a cadaver. Uh, we have a cancer research lab. Here's Dr. Carmichael um, milking one of his Gila monsters. We're t trying to test the, the venom for anti-cancer properties. So we're trying to train young people how to do cancer research. We have a new school of health professions. Uh, just in the last couple years, we have a new building for them this fall that they'll be entering into, a beautiful new building. And uh, here are some of the programs in the School of Health Professions. We have all the appropriate accreditations, including the highest level, which is regional accreditation, SAC COC. And 89% of BTO grads were hired or in grad school within six months of graduating. This is last year's figures, not the COVID year. We um, are very uh, affordable, and US News and World Report calls us a, a best value university. If you can't pay for your college any other way, you can always join the ROTC, Air Force or Army. So I know not all of you are uh, interested in science, I'm afraid. It hurts me to say that, but uh, uh, there we have under uh, plus programs and we have information there. My wife's got some cards. If you're in seventh through 12th grade, my wife has some cards that you can fill out for us and we'll put you in the drawing. So any, anybody here, seventh through 12th, fill out a card for us. There's one here, a couple here, okay. Good, well, here's our contact information. My email, feel free to, to write. Uh, just heard from somebody in Australia yesterday that saw the program and happy to correspond with you. That's our website. Uh, we plan to be in middle Atlantic states and New England in the fall and then Florida and the southern states in the, in the, in the, south, in the second semester. We also have some brochures about that. If we can come uh, to your church or school and help out, do programs and speak, uh, we'd be happy to do that. So thank you for your good attentions, do good attention today, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day at the Creation Museum. Thank you all for coming today.